fascinated by what chemistry can teach us about biological systems as an undergraduate science student in Australia. And I'm going to tell you today how this has led me across continents to establish a research team at Oxford University studying bacteria that are truly inspirational in their ability to use hydrogen as a clean energy source. Most of the attention on hydrogen in the media at the moment is on hydrogen as, the, as a possible fuel source that can be gradually lessen our dependence on fossil fuels as a potential clean, sustainable fuel. And we're gradually starting to see some hydrogen vehicles appearing on the roads of London in preparation for the Olympics, buses and taxis. Some of these are com uh, use combustion engines that burn hydrogen in place of petrol or diesel, and others are fuel cell vehicles, such as this one here, that uh, use a fuel cell to rip apart hydrogen and release electrons that flow as an electrical current to drive the vehicle. At the moment, the hydrogen, or most of the hydrogen we have available, is not truly a renewable source because much of it is actually produced from fossil fuels. Um, but the, the dream is that one day we will we'll be able to produce hydrogen as a renewable fuel cleanly from water using energy sources like sunlight or wind power. Um, and I'm not going to go into the details of those today because that would be a whole other TED talk or maybe a whole series of TED events. Um, but what I'm going to tell you today is some of what we can learn from bacteria um, about how to use hydrogen cleanly for energy. I'm not going to overload you with too much chemistry today, and actually much of the chemistry I'm going to talk about involves the simplest of all reactions and some of the simplest molecules. Hydrogen and oxygen gases are built from just two atoms linked together, H2 or O2. Intuitively, we know that when hydrogen and oxygen are mixed, they uh, react together in an uncontrolled way in a huge explosion to release energy in the form of heat and light. The real challenge is how we can control the energy that's released from this reaction. When hydrogen and oxygen come together, the chemical product of that reaction is water. But this huge amount of energy that's released is lost as heat and light and is very difficult to capture in this sort of context. From an explosion like this, we're left simply with perhaps a faint ringing in our ears from the bang of the explosion and a burnt patch on the ground, but that doesn't help us much when it comes to harnessing the energy from the reaction. Meanwhile, in, back in the uh, 1840s, Welsh scientist or Welsh lawyer turned scientist William Grove showed that it was possible to bring together hydrogen and oxygen in a controlled way to produce electricity, so to harness that electricity, the energy from that reaction in the form of an electrical current. And the trick here is to keep the gases separate so that they never actually mix. So in one compartment of this device called a fuel cell, hydrogen comes in and is split apart into atoms and then separated into positively charged hydrogen nuclei called protons and negatively charged electrons which pass through an external wire, a circuit, um, to provide us with an electrical current and then these recombine um, in the other compartment with oxygen to produce water. So the energy of the reaction in this case has been harnessed as electricity. But these reactions don't just happen spontaneously or unassisted. We need special catalysts to help speed up the rates of these reactions. And the best catalysts that we currently have available to help with these reactions are platinum, a metal that currently trades at around the same price as gold. Meanwhile, microorganisms have been doing the same sort of chemistry for billions of years using metals that are much cheaper than platinum. And I'm going to have a look today at how that can happen. In the very early, um, for very early life on Earth, hydrogen was an abundant energy source because the atmosphere was rich in hydrogen from volcanic activity. And so microorganisms had no trouble in finding hydrogen to, to snack on. 
But today, our, atmosphere, um, our lower atmosphere contains only about 0.5 parts per million hydrogen. That means one hydrogen molecule in every two million molecules of other gases, oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon dioxide. So, so hydrogen is no longer um, widely abundant in the air. But nevertheless, hydrogen is still a very important fuel source, energy source, for microorganisms. So where does this hydrogen come from? Well, it turns out that there are cycles of hydrogen production and hydrogen utilisation by microorganisms living in all sorts of environments. And this happens even in our own stomachs. So we have beneficial bacteria that help to break down some of the sugars and carbohydrates that we eat in our diets. And these bacteria produce hydrogen as a waste product using the positively charged hydrogen nuclei, protons from water, as a way to mop up excess electrons and blowing off hydrogen as an unwanted waste product. Well, hydrogen is too good to waste, and other bacteria have found ways of making use of that hydrogen to live on. We actually always breathe out a trace of, of, of hydrogen in our breath. We don't really realise this most of the time. And in fact, hydrogen in breath is used in diagnosis of certain medical conditions like lactose intolerance. Um, certain bacteria, that there is evidence that certain harmful bacteria like salmonella are actually more able to infect us if, we, if they're able to make use of that hydrogen that's been produced in our gut from, other, from the action of other bacteria. <coughs> This sort of cycling of hydrogen happens all around us and in the environment also. So if we imagine a damp soil sample, deep down in the soil are ancient bacteria that have changed little in billions of years and use hydrogen um, or throw out hydrogen as a waste product as they break down or decaying organic matter, dead leaves for example. And as they start to blow out hydrogen as a waste product, other bacteria in the soil have found ways to use that hydrogen for energy. So as we move up through this soil sample, we find bacteria that are able to consume hydrogen and are increasingly good at being able to scavenge the traces of hydrogen that are available. So by the time we get to the surface of the soil, we find bacteria that are able to live on just the trace of hydrogen that filters up through the soil. And this is a particular bacterium called Relstonia, which lives in the surface of the soil and where it's able to extract energy from hydrogen and oxygen just as in the fuel cell reaction. And if we start to zoom in inside the cell of this bacterium to actually look at the uh, processes that allow it to make use of hydrogen, we start to find the molecular equivalents of the sort of devices that we as chemists, physicists or engineers might use to make hydrogen. So we find the molecular equivalent of fuel cells, circuits, wires and capacitors all inside this microbial cell. And I'm going to see today how we can make use of that. Zooming right inside the cell, we start to find the proteins, the, uh, nature's catalysts called enzymes, that allow bacteria to be able to use hydrogen for energy so efficiently. Now, science is rarely done now um, by individuals. Science is usually a collaborative research effort. And my team of chemists collaborate closely with microbiologists in, in Germany who've developed specialised procedures for breaking open these cells and isolating out proteins like this one, the enzymes, that are the catalysts in nature that help to speed up the breaking of hydrogen and the breaking apart of, of hydrogen. Inside this protein, so the, the grey coily parts of this protein that you can see here is this hydrogenase enzyme that is responsible for breaking apart hydrogen. The grey coily parts of this are the protein framework, but wrapped up inside those are metal atoms that give this enzyme its special catalytic properties. And we can now look a little closer inside this enzyme where we see that the the two metal atoms are buried right inside this protein and are the catalytic centre where hydrogen is pulled apart. Remember from our fuel cell, we said that platinum was the best catalyst that we have available to us. Well, nature has managed to do the same thing using cheap <coughs> metals, nickel and iron, the metals found in stainless steel. And these metals are, are wrapped up inside this whole protein framework, but when a hydrogen enters through special channels inside the protein, it's torn apart at this centre and stripped into positively charged hydrogen nuclei that are sent out into the water around the protein and negatively charged electrons. And remember, in our fuel cell, we had a wire to conduct away the electrons. Well, in this case, we have um, a special uh, chain of these metal clusters which allow the electrons to be conducted away from this catalytic centre in the same sort of way.
And we can see this happening in our laboratory. If we put this protein molecule, this enzyme molecule, onto an electrode, we can record that delivery of electrons in the form of an electrical current in our circuit. So the hydrogen atom is conducted in through this channel inside the protein, split apart and um, into its uh, component positive and negatively charged parts. Now we've looked so far at some of the simplest of chemical reactions involving just stripping apart hydrogen into, into its component parts. But enzymes in biology really come into their own when they start to catalyze to help with much more complicated chemical transformations. And this is two examples of drug molecules that are produced in large quantities by pharmaceutical companies using enzymes to help with those reactions. So the pharmaceutical industry are already becoming increasingly interested in how we can make use of enzymes to carry out very, very selective chemical transformations. In these sorts of molecules, if one of these chemical bonds between atoms points in the wrong direction, we have a molecule that has the same chemical composition but can have very, very different properties inside our body. So it's absolutely critical for pharmaceutical companies to be able to produce drugs that have exactly the right chemical structure and with all the bonds pointing in exactly the right direction. And that's where enzymes are particularly good at carrying out reactions. And we're going to see now um, some research that's come out of my group in the last six months or so um, for, for using chains of enzymes to be able to put atoms in very selective positions onto a molecule such as this. In this case, this is an antihypertensive drug used to treat uh, high blood pressure. So we're going to see how an enzyme could help with putting the hydrogen atoms into very selective positions in a molecule such as this. Now, one more part we need to understand here is that nature's magic bullet for putting hydrogen atoms in the right place is actually a negatively charged hydrogen atom, which is a special package of a proton, H+, and two electrons, now giving us a negatively charged hydrogen atom called hydride. And nature's carrier for that hydride is this special molecule called NADH, which we'll come across a couple of times in the next slides. Now, what we've done here is taken this enzyme molecule that we've isolated from a bacterial cell in conjunction with our microbiology collaborators, and we've attached it onto a bead of graphite. Now, the graphite is able to conduct away the electrons from that reaction as hydrogen is split to give the electrons and the positively charged protons. So we're now using this graphite bead as a way of storing up the electrons from that reaction to see how we can use them to make hydride. So we now put the next step together. We take an enzyme that's specialised at combining electrons and a positively charged hydrogen atom to turn these into negative hydride, which can then be used to, or, or then loaded onto this special carrier molecule, NADH, so that it's ready to be fired onto another molecule at just the right position. So putting all this together, we split hydrogen apart, we store electrons from that reaction in this bead, split apart these positively charged hydrogen nuclei that are then recombined very selectively with two electrons to make this special hydride molecule. So we've now split hydrogen into an H plus and an H minus, which are poised, ready to add on to another molecule. So here we have the, the hydride firing molecule, NADH, coupled with a, a positively charged hydrogen in the solution, and we combine those with a target drug molecule. And by adding these together, we can put these on in very selective ways with the bonds pointing in just the right direction to make exactly the molecule we want to make. So what we're excited about now is the possibility of driving these sorts of chemical reactions using the energy from hydrogen. It might seem like a lot of effort to go to just to move around a couple of atoms, but actually chemists at the lab bench might spend months trying to design procedures for how to make a molecule with atoms in just the right position, and then at the end have a complex mixture of products that they have to go to great lengths to separate. This is a way of putting atoms into just the right position on a molecule using the power of hydrogen tamed chemically by biological catalysts to allow us to put those hydrogen atoms in just the right place. So what we're quite excited about now in my group is the possibility of using these mixture of 
graphite beads with biological building blocks to put together a whole system of catalysts for carrying out all sorts of chemical transformations. Nature has had about four billion years to perfect this chemistry and we have a lot to learn from looking at nature's cellular chemical factories where we can learn and gain all sorts of specialised catalysts for carrying out very, very selective and specific chemical reactions and in this case reactions that are all driven by the energy from hydrogen. Thank you.